I Brakshit. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Pooja. Hello and uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, um, uh, everyone. Thanks for dialing in to our uh, next Consistent Compounders webinar. Um, uh, let me quickly start the screen share. There you go. Um, yeah, just to set the context, uh, this is the performance chart and, uh, and the chart itself has a lot of uh, messaging in it. Uh, when you look at the short-term performance bars, both on absolute as well as relative, there's a lot of volatility between one month versus six months versus one year. Uh, but the moment you look at the three years and uh, almost four years since inception, bars both in a, a relative manner as well as in an absolute manner, uh, very limited uh, volatility. And that uh, is sort of the context uh, uh, of this webinar, where we're trying to focus on uh, different types of risks and, uh, and how an investor, particularly via our philosophy, should uh, make an attempt to, uh, to avoid them or eliminate them. Now, uh, broadly speaking, just to, uh, uh, just, do, just to elaborate on the context, um, there are two types of risks uh, that we uh, that we believe investors get exposed to when they invest in equities. Uh, the first uh, risk is uh, uh, sort of a binary risk, which should be completely eliminated because if it plays out, um, uh, there is a massive capital erosion, not just a reduction in returns. You can actually be wiped out of a bulk of your capital invested in the relevant stock. And these are risks uh, such as the risk of, say, um, accounting fraud or, um, uh, or the, the risk of poor governance. Um, now, these are risks which shouldn't just be mitigated. They should be, uh, they should be an attempt to eliminate these risks. And um, uh, uh, there are several tools uh, which you can use to eliminate risks of accounting fraud, risks of uh, poor corporate governance. Uh, um, at Marcellus, we use our proprietary fraud detection framework to eliminate these types of binary risks, which, which either uh, uh, they don't play out in your portfolio until then, you're all right. But if they do play out, there's a massive capital erosion. Um, in our uh, fraud detection framework, um, uh, there are both qualitative and quantitative aspects, which you would have heard uh, our colleagues uh, uh, Ashwin and Tej elaborate on in their webinars, newsletters, um, in the past, and um, uh, last year we published a book called Diamonds in the Dust. Uh, we've uh, we've elaborated um, in great detail how we eliminate uh, the risk of uh, risk of accounting fraud, risk of poor corporate governance standards of a company when we build a portfolio. So uh, we'll not spend too much time talking about those risks in this webinar. In this webinar, we'll focus on the second type, which you see at the bottom of this screen. Uh, which are the risks that can't be fully eliminated, but can be mitigated to a very significant degree. Um, and these are risks typically, are, uh, which can be classified into two parts. One is volatility, and the second is weak rate of compounding, right? Volatility means uh, uh, effectively uncertainty around the average expected return. And weak rate of compounding means um, uh, not healthy enough level of average return, right? So one is one is the level of average return and one is the volatility around the average. Both of these are risks caused by different factors. Uh, what are the tools that, uh, that an investor can use to mitigate these two risks and hence deliver healthy compounding is what we'll focus on, uh, focus on in this webinar. Um, so coming to the risk of noise, uh, to begin with, um, uh, let me just give a few examples of what can cause volatility in returns uh, for an equity investor. Um, so uh, things like, say, FII, DII flows, right? Sector rotations. Um, these are uh, sort of keywords which are used very often. We get lots of questions uh, from our existing clients or prospective clients around um, uh, what do we see uh, flows doing in the stock markets? Do we see FII outflows or do we see FII inflows? Uh, that's an example of a source of volatility which doesn't affect the fundamentals of 
pretty much any business um, uh, as long as that business is not dependent on those flows for running their day to day activities right so the share price does um, uh, 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 sort of move up and down uh, but those are uh, those are some types of risks then uh, any political development first february budget monetary policy uh, meetings outcome uh, macro factors such as interest rates inflation um, uh, uh, currency so on and so forth these are these are bunch of other factors uh, which are external to a company usually um, and uh, and and as long as they don't affect the fundamentals of the company they, they just cause noise they just cause volatility in the share price of the of the business and um, uh, broadly speaking anything that doesn't affect the rate at which free cash flows of a business will compound in future anything which doesn't affect the rate at which earnings of a business revenues of a business will compound in the future um, uh, you can broadly call it noise rather than signal rather than any indication of uh, of where the investment returns will be of an equity investor uh, over the long term now that's where the long term piece becomes very interesting so this chart that you see has the time period of holding a particular stock or an index or a um, or a portfolio uh, the time period is on the horizontal axis uh, and the the range of outcomes uh, that you can get for a particular time period is uh, is sort of uh, measured on the vertical axis right uh, 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 what this chart is effectively showing is that the shorter the holding period uh, a six month a one year holding period the wider is the range of outcomes because over a six month period something like an fii outflow something like a dii inflow so on and so forth all of these factors can affect the share price compounding uh, but these uh, these factors interestingly they even out as time period uh, 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 becomes longer right um, what is quite remarkable is that the biggest reduction in the jaw between the upper end of the range of outcomes the top line and the lower end of the range of outcomes the biggest reduction doesn't happen before one year time period or after three year time period right we'll we'll show you some quantified uh, Uh, data points uh, this is just for illustration the graph in the subsequent slides we'll show you for different types of stocks and assets uh, the quantified data points one thing common across all types of let's say nifty 50 sensex ccp all types of such uh, 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 stocks that you can invest in is that the the degree of noise is is reduced to the greatest extent if you elongate your holding period from one year to around 3 years and that is a very very important and very interesting um, uh, 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 shift in the time frame of holding uh, 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 worth bearing in mind uh, why because the moment you look at uh, returns for holding period longer than 3 year uh, you are looking at outcomes of factors which are more fundamental and less luck oriented the moment you look at returns of any stock for time periods less than 1 year you looking at outcomes which are based on factors drivers that are more noise oriented luck oriented less fundamentals oriented and hence the jaw is very wide in uh, between the upper end of the range and and lower end of the range um, this is uh, this this is this is one part of uh, risk mitigation the moment you increase regardless of whether you invest in ccp or nifty or sensex or lcp or kcp or any other type of equity assets the biggest reduction in noise happens when you move from one year holding period to three years the second type of uh, 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 sort of risk mitigation tool that you can adopt is uh, quality of the company itself right uh, so um, to give you some context for this slide if you are invested in an asset where the underlying fundamentals in the long run compound at only let's say 10% right uh, the chart on the left then um, any noise around that average of 10% can actually lead to the outcome being uh, less than 10 now how meaningful is that uh, that uh, that risk uh, think about it like this if you can't compound 
uh, your investment at at least eight to ten percent, you are probably eroding your capital because your lifestyle cost inflation itself for most of us on this call, it would be at least in the high single digits, if not in the low double digits uh, CAGR. And hence, if your equity investments aren't fetching you uh, at least eight to ten percent, then effectively you are you are eroding capital. Now, if the long-term average uh, compounding of the fundamentals is itself just 10%, then you really need to be on the, on the upper side of the risk, as in the risk should play out on the positive side only, rather than on the negative side for you to compound your wealth. But the moment you start investing in assets where the average rate of compounding is, uh, is, is let's say, 20 in this illustration, um, then uh, no matter how unlucky you are in the longer run, right? For time periods, again, longer than say three years, no matter how unlucky you were for a three year, five year, seven year time horizon, uh, you will end up compounding your wealth. You will end up compounding your uh, your investments at at least say 15, 17%. And, and that's where most risks uh, get mitigated uh, that could have otherwise stopped you from compounding your wealth in the long run. So those are the two broad tools um, uh, to summarize it in our uh, in our coffee can investing book, uh, uh, we had published uh, an analysis akin to the chart shown here, where um, if you plot standard deviation on the vertical axis or the measure of risk on the vertical axis, and then portfolio performance on the horizontal axis, and then let's say uh, you do you you do measurement of uh, uh, your your outcome. Uh, basis Nifty 50 investment or basis, let's say, CCP. Uh, now, CCP could be uh, uh, high quality stocks, um, either identified by Marcellus or by yourself. Um, if you do high quality investing, um, then your even your one year investment horizon, right, which obviously will have a lot of volatility attached to it, the standard deviation will be high. Even your one year investment horizon on average will give you a healthy return. But remember, that is only on average. Uh, the worst case scenario of a one-year investment horizon could actually be a weak return. But the moment you increase the investment horizon to three years, then rather than worrying about uh, 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 the, 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 the sort of high-risk, high-return approach uh, or worrying about low-risk, low-return, the capital asset pricing model, the the, the standard uh, uh, risk rewards that we get uh, taught in, um, in various textbooks, uh, you can actually get an arbitrage of low risk, high return, right? Uh, and this is again, uh, a combination of two tools. Tool number one, time horizon, which is the size of the bubble, uh, whether it be for Nifty 50, which is the blue bubbles, or uh, 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 whether it be for CCP, which is the green bubbles, the time horizon, the longer the time horizon, the bigger the size of the bubble, the lower down will be the bubble position in this chart, which means the lower will be the risk. Uh, but more importantly, the more quality oriented your portfolio is, the more to the right hand side will be your bubble, right? And uh, bottom right quadrant of this um, of this chart is actually the best quadrant where where you've got the benefit of both patience or high uh, 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 long holding period as well as quality which is high rate of uh, uh, fundamental compounding underlying in your portfolio. Very quickly, uh, just to summarize uh, uh, this via, via uh, uh, CCP versus say Nifty 50. This is uh, the, the chart on the left is related to Marcellus's current CCP portfolio, um, uh, but uh, back tested over various time periods in the past. Uh, obviously, uh, our, our historical track record is uh, is only roughly four years old. So some of these back tests go uh, for a time period longer than that. But even within the last four years, you can see the same outcome. If you invest in CCP for any time period, uh, say longer than three years, right? The variability uh, of the outcomes is limited. Uh, the, the 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 worst case scenario of the outcomes as well is not too bad. And the average rate of compounding historically has been incredibly healthy, right? Uh, the height of the bars is low. The average is high, which is what you want. Height of the bar is indicative of volatility. 
and the average is indicated of, of the rate at which you will compound within that volatility, right? The moment you invest in Nifty 50, you can see how the chart changes from left side to the right side. Uh, the volatility does reduce, but it reduces only to help you compound at or a little above your lifestyle cost inflation, broadly speaking. It doesn't allow you to compound wealth in a very meaningful way. Um, and that effectively is the, is the outcome that, uh, that an investor needs to, needs to target. Now, um, effectively, uh, the, the, the main message of this exercise is uh, when you look at questions and, 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 and we, are, we are conveying this message repeatedly and um, uh, in this webinar particularly because in the last 12 months, there has been a lot of noise there has been a lot of questions around capital erosion over a six month horizon, over a three month horizon in, an, in a, a portfolio like CCP. Uh, there, has been, uh, there has been a lot of volatility when you go from one month to another. Uh, the moment you increase the time horizon and you, you keep the quality of the fundamentals of a portfolio high, in the longer run, you are positioned in the, in the best quadrant where luck plays less of a role, fundamentals play a very significant role in your rate of compounding. And that effectively is what uh, I began this webinar with. Uh, if you look at our performance chart of Marcellus' CCP portfolio, it's quite interesting. O over a one month period, uh, there's a very exciting outcome, uh, right? Both in a relative way, 600 basis points of outperformance, as well as in an absolute way, 15% of absolute return. Um, if somebody missed this, uh, right, while trying to time entry exits, then there's a massive, uh, massive miss. But at the same time, uh, the moment you look at the last six months or one year, you won't, you won't have missed much if you miss the last one year of compounding here or the last six months of compounding. So uh, different time horizons have very different messages. If all these time horizons are shorter than shorter than one year, right? Uh, that's really the noise that has played out in the last uh, 12 months. Um, uh, but the moment you look at three years, whether you looked at the three-year chart today or you would have looked at it one month ago prior to this 14.42% compounding, the three-year chart would have looked the same, right? Uh, it wouldn't have mattered to you what the entry point or the exit point of the three year chart was, your rate of compounding would have been a healthy 18, 20, 22, 24%, somewhere around that. Your outperformance versus the broader benchmarks would have also been healthy. You would have compounded your wealth over a three year period, nearly doubling it, three, three and a half year period, nearly doubling it at that rate, regardless of whether you entered um, at, a, at a particular point of time during 2019 or 2018, or whether you exited uh, uh, or whether you looked at this return today or one month ago or two months ago, so on and so forth, right? So that's that's really the mitigation of noise uh, that is worth bearing in mind. This is the jump from one year to three years uh, where, where the, the jaw of that chart previously I showed you, it narrows down meaningfully. We've, we've lived through that in the last 12 months and hence uh, uh, I thought it was, uh, it was um, uh, important just to reiterate reiterate this point. Now, coming to why we believe the, the portfolio fundamentals um, have compounded according to us in a way that gives us the conviction that over the longer term, this is not a portfolio which will compound at say eight or 10% in its free cash flows. It will actually compound at a level where um, even the worst case scenario around your small bit of noise or luck element in the long term compounding will not uh, disappoint you on the outcome because the underlying fundamentals will be compounding at a very healthy pace. There's enough evidence of all of those uh, factors in the recently reported uh, quarterly results, um, which uh, the moment you look at, uh, say, the financial sector, uh, you see a very strong momentum of uh, loan book growth, premium income growth, uh, whether it be the insurers or the lenders. Uh, the rate at which... Uh, uh, the, the loan book has grown or the profit after tax has grown for many of these companies over the last one quarter, two quarter, three quarters has been incredibly higher than the rate at which these companies have grown their fundamentals still 
a year, two years, or even prior to two years prior to COVID, um, uh, because the market share gain run rate for these companies has increased. Uh, you might have heard us talk about uh, uh, some of the factors for market share gains, broadly summarizing acquisitive activity, uh, massive investments in tech, and a radical transition from traditional businesses to, to new age businesses that is underway. Uh, some of these uh, companies are, um, are, are, are very radically transforming. So for instance, a Bajaj Finance, um, uh, 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 some of them have acquired very large size businesses, let's say an HDFC Life or an ICICI Lombard, where HDFC Life acquired Side Life, ICICI Lombard acquired Bharti AXA, et cetera. And almost all of these companies have heavily invested in systems and processes over the past couple of years. And you can see the outcome of that. Um, when it comes to um, uh, the non-financials companies, um, uh, so Titan particularly has grown uh, uh, jewelry sales by a very healthy um, uh, sort of 22 to 23% CAGR over a three-year, four-year time period, um, uh, which is a stronger rate of growth uh, than what Titan used to report till a couple of years ago. Uh, there's a massive uh, expansion beyond jewelry that Titan has, uh, has done. So Carrot Lane, uh, its, uh, its uh, economy jewelry variant uh, has grown at around 50% CAGR over the last three years. And its contribution to the sales of Titan has doubled from 2.5% uh, three years ago to more than 5% uh, today. And, uh, and that has also come along with a massive improvement in Profitability, the but a bit margin of Carrot Lane, it stood at seven uh, percent uh, in Q1 23, and till a few quarters ago, it was it was at a break even or a loss making level. Um, now that's that's an example of uh, uh, the kind of transition that a company as large as Titan in a space as large as jewelry uh, uh, can uh, uh, can undergo from being a traditional player. Uh, to a, to becoming a becoming a more new age oriented company, um, and beyond jewelry, the eyewear business of Titan has uh, has grown at, uh, at at a very healthy rate as well. EBIT margins. Now, the eyewear business, remember, till three years ago was a loss making business for Titan. Today, the EBIT margins uh, are around eighteen to twenty percent, very healthy, and uh, it's also adding uh, eyewear stores under Fast Track brand now. Uh, which is adding to the growth momentum here. So that's uh, that's Titan. Uh, similarly, TCS. Um, uh, although there there would be concerns from uh, uh, from many of you around what is the outlook of TCS given uh, uh, the 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 risk of a recession in in the developed world economies uh, and TCS exports its services to to those countries. Uh, but the order flow here and uh, also along with that. Uh, the 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 sort of benefit of benefit of uh, 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 applications for various customers of TCS all moving to cloud uh, and hence requiring for a for a demand for centralized service providers in IT, uh, uh, which plays in favor of TCS massively because TCS's biggest strength is to provide large scale uh, manpower, talented manpower. When it uh, uh, when it provides its IT services to the customers, and uh, when uh, migration to cloud, migration of data to data lakes leads to centralization of uh, of IT, uh, IT uh, consolidation and centralization of IT uh, vendors uh, uh, for all the large corporates uh, in these developed countries. Uh, there's a massive demand for uh, service providers such as TCS who can provide large scale high quality talent at cheaper rates um, uh, which is uh, which is probably where where tcs is uh, is the biggest beneficiary expected of the developments of the last 2 3 years in the space of it uh, asian paints 20% uh, volume growth over the last 4 years uh, remarkable given the size of this firm uh, and that 20% is not just for the quarter gone by for the last 5 quarters in a row the four-year CAGR in volume of Asian paints has been around 19, 20, 21 a very healthy rate of growth. Um, and along with that uh, rate of growth, uh, this company is 
is expanding its network to beyond just pain dealers. Uh, most of the uh, recent network expansion has happened to hardware dealers, cement dealers, plywood dealers, electric uh, uh, electric uh, uh, shops, steel and pipes shops, particularly in tier three and tier four cities of this country, um, which is uh, probably where Asian Paints is, is starting to widen its canvas in a very meaningful manner. And that uh, very nicely uh, uh, is, is a transition uh, 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 towards home improvement rather than paint as the, as the size of the canvas that this company is focusing on. Uh, more than 25% uh, uh, CAGR in home improvement segment revenue reported over the last four years. Uh, uh, their business was loss-making till two, three years ago. Uh, it, is, uh, it is profitable now. And, um, and, and, and the way the execution of uh, uh, home decor, home improvement uh, on the services side, as well as on the merchandise side, side the way it is progressing, uh, gives us a lot of conviction uh, that, uh, that, uh, that this company is uh, likely to retain its competitive edge uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, Dr. Lal Path Labs, we uh, significantly increased uh, the exposure of many of, uh, almost all of our clients in Dr. Lal Path Labs when the share price uh, fell significantly three or four months ago. Um, already we've been rewarded uh, uh, for that move in a relatively healthy way because Dr. Lal has compounded at a rate faster than the rest of the portfolio since that, uh, since that move. Uh, there's a massive jaw opening uh, versus uh, uh, other listed competitors of Dr. Lal when you look at non-COVID sales CAGR um, on an organic uh, basis as well as including inorganic. Compare it against Thyrocare, Metropolis, et cetera. Uh, there's a massive market share gain uh, that you see happen there. Um, and uh, along with that, uh, suburban acquisition, um, especially when some of their competitors in West and South India are, uh, are undergoing a little bit of weakness in, uh, in fundamentals, the suburban acquisition is likely to expand the footprint of Dr. Lal uh, beyond North and East uh, in a meaningful manner. Um, Nestle, again, healthy volume growth, uh, 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 double digit in most of their large categories. And um, and 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 expect uh, expect this company to compound uh, in the in the high teens. So so that's um, uh, broadly speaking. Likewise for Page Industries, Speedlight, Divis, uh, massive network expansion, uh, massive tech investments. Uh, Page has actually uh, benefited meaningfully from uh, demand forecasting related tech improvements and auto replenishment systems, which have allowed this company to. Uh, expand its product portfolio and distribution reach in a very meaningful manner without undergoing a working capital stress as it expands the number of SKUs and the number of dealers it services uh, with those SKUs. Um, uh, likewise, for Pedilite, uh, DV's lab, uh, the generic business, which till a quarter ago, I think, uh, or for some commentators in the market was a concern, uh, is, uh, is nowhere, nowhere uh, a, a concerning factor. It wasn't. Uh, in our minds, a concern previously, and uh, and and it is it is growing at a healthy pace. And uh, pipeline for growth in future through new product launches um, very strong here. Um, so that's uh, effectively the color of uh, fundamental progress of these companies in the last uh, uh, quarter, uh, which is reflective of uh, benefits from the crisis, benefits from capital allocation decisions that have been made in the last two or three years. And we expect the fundamentals uh, to compound actually at a faster pace than they would have had COVID not happened, had uh, uh, the, the disruptions around Russia, Ukraine, uh, global supply chain uh, 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 disruptions, had they not happened over the last one year. Um, uh, 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 and hence, uh, we remain highly convinced about the, the average, if you, if you remember going back to the charts I showed you at the beginning, the average of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of the fundamental rate of compounding being high enough uh, to sort of overcome any concern somebody would have around timing of entry exits, around macro, around noise, around FII, DIF flows, so on and so forth. Um, so I'll stop there and um, um, uh, promote the, uh, can you take a few questions that we might have already? Yes, yes, sure. Thanks, Sakshi. That was lovely. Um, so we have 
a few questions come on and just to reiterate uh, people if you can uh, put your questions in the q a box below we'll try and take uh, as many of them as possible so we'll start with a question i'm not sure if i understand it right uh, the gentleman says asian paints is a 42 billion dollar company now uh, 42 billion market cap business how does marcellus see this compound consistently over the foreseeable future and act in a timely manner when it hits the ceiling so i guess um, the gentleman is asking how big can it really get without it become uh, becoming too big for the economy that it's operating in a very valid question, and um, um, and I'm I'm glad you asked that for Asian Paints because that's actually uh, the the company in our portfolio where this question is most valid, or probably the only company in our question uh, in our portfolio where this question is valid because everywhere else the market share of the companies that we've invested in is hardly five percent or ten percent or at max fifteen percent of the industry size. Here, Asian Paints, uh, even six years ago was more than half of the organized paint industry, right? Now, when you are more than 50% market share, um, uh, quite obvious that market share number at best can increase to 60 or 65. It can't touch uh, 70, 80, or even if it does, it can't cross 100 for sure. So there is a limit. You're, you're right. There's a ceiling. There's a limit, uh, which is where um, uh, we, we want our portfolio companies to allocate their capital to add new revenue growth drivers, widen the canvas, increase the size of the pool within which they are operating. Um, uh, 10 years ago, uh, uh, Asian Paints uh, uh, started their journey with uh, uh, sleek acquisition, SS acquisition and kitchen in Bath. Um, that was one uh, 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 attempt to widen the canvas. For the first six, seven years, uh, no significant progress was made. In fact, more disappointments than success, I would say, for us uh, as, as, uh, as investors, uh, we could see from those capital allocation decisions. Uh, but then in the last five or six years, both in terms of home decor as well as in a few other areas, We've seen uh, uh, Asian Paints uh, move in the right direction with, uh, with, a, with an approach that gives us confidence that it's not the paint industry only uh, which, uh, which Asian Paints is operating in. Uh, the canvas is much wider than that now. Uh, the first bit was 2016 to 2020. Uh, there was a significant expansion of the industry within which Asian Paints operates beyond paint. Uh, initially, it was waterproofing, where Dr. Fixit uh, had been a monopoly. Asian Paints uh, today controls uh, more than 25-30% market share in, uh, in waterproofing. They've got a product called Smart Care there. They've, they've actually expanded the industry in some ways. Pedilite was more the masonry waterproofing. Asian Paints is more the top application uh, painter-oriented waterproofing as well along with it. Um, and uh, and that was uh, was one large new industry added to their product portfolio. And then putty, uh, right? Uh, putty was uh, always uh, either dominated by the cement companies or it was an unorganized industry. And Asian Paints has taken a massive market share uh, in the putty industry. Um, uh, one of the reasons actually why most cement companies you see now uh, uh, trying to get into paints because they're uh, channel partners have uh, have started uh, getting them paneled on on Asian Paints' uh, 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 channel sales. Initially with Putty and many of these channel partners are now also stocking uh, products beyond just Putty, uh, including paints, waterproofing, so on and so forth. So Putty, waterproofing, uh, paint brushes, rollers. Sorry, I'm having trouble. Uh, these are uh, uh, these are the the products in which uh, Asian Paints invested, uh, uh, Asian Paints expanded initially. Um, the most uh, recent addition to the uh, 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 sort of product portfolio, services portfolio, is uh, home decor, home improvement part of the business, where uh, first of all, they've acquired many other companies on the merchandise side. So whether it be fabric, they acquired a firm called Pure, uh, lighting, they acquired a firm called White Teak uh, a few months ago. Um, in, in door and window frame, they acquired a firm called Weather Seal. 
Uh, they've got their uh, own in-house brand called Bath Sense for sanitary wear, which has uh, expanded its range of merchandise incredibly over the last one year, particularly. Um, uh, so much so that uh, the range of merchandise actually is now full-fledged from all the way from economy to the most premium end of uh, sanitary wear uh, uh, products. Uh, and uh, along with that merchandise expansion, what Asian Paints is uh, is targeting is uh, is 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 covering the whole uh, whole home renovation piece, both from a product side, but more importantly also from a services side. Remember, when it comes to getting a house renovated, right, and that's a very large industry. If uh, if you go for a ten lakh or a twenty lakh or a thirty lakh ticket size renovation of your house, um, uh, uh, it's totally unorganized in terms of the service element. You appoint a contractor because an architect won't want to work with you uh, on only a 10, 20, 30 lakh ticket size um, because the architect won't get economic viability uh, by sort of spending four, five, six months uh, across different types of uh, uh, labor workforce of applicators from electricians to plumbers to carpenters to masons, et cetera. And then the, if the architect makes hardly five or 10% margin on a 20 lakh project, uh, uh, then that one or two lakhs uh, from a four or five months of effort is not worth it. Um, and hence, the industry is heavily unorganized around the service of uh, project management of home renovation, which is where uh, 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 Asian Paints has, has entered with its beautiful home service, uh, which uh, the initial channel checks that we've done are, uh, are quite encouraging. Uh, the value add that they have uh, uh, targeted is one around uh, uh, faster turnaround times uh, by eliminating sources of inefficiencies in the labor execution on site. Uh, secondly, ensuring standard levels of quality so that the contractor doesn't cut corners by putting in a poor quality channel for a cabinet's drawers or putting in a poor quality uh, adhesive behind the tiles, so on and so forth. So, so the quality standards uh, uh, have been maintained and uh, and and finally uh, the convenience factor where Asian Paints takes on the uh, uh, the, the the sort of uh, coordination across various types of labor workforce, various types of applicators, uh, so that project execution can can be uh, uh, done without any inconvenience, without any hassle, uh, in a timely manner and uh, that too with standard levels of quality. Now, this is significantly superior to uh, what uh, some of the, uh, let's say, home lane, live space, these types of uh, players have been um, uh, attempting. Why? Because uh, this is fully customized. Um, in effect, they are not, Asian Paints is beautiful home service, for instance, here, is not offering particle board or MDF board uh, on the carpentry work done completely by machines uh, in a non-customizable standard fashion. Here, they are actually offering complete customization. Just the execution of the project, the project management piece is trying to be organized here. So different elements of non-paint business uh, being attempted, many of them being done successfully. Uh, there has been uh, an increase in the capital investment, CAPEX, around many of these initiatives. One of the reasons why in the last five, six years, you've seen returns on capital employed for Asian paints drop by five, six percent uh, because the investments have accelerated in this space. Uh, but uh, the way we understand it, uh, there's a very high probability that the pricing power in some of these areas will be high. The scalability is uh, significant. And as long as we see uh, Asian paints uh, finding uh, 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 moats, uh, finding competitive advantages around these non-paint areas, uh, we don't see the risk of the ceiling being there, but you are very right. Uh, if we don't see Asian Paints uh, successfully expanding in uh, some of these areas, then the ceiling is imminent. Uh, the ceiling uh, will be hit in the paint industry in the next 5, 10 or 15 years. And uh, and clearly the share price will be found overvalued. And, uh, and the moment we, we think of that uh, as a big risk, uh, we'll take corrective action in our portfolio. Uh, but as of now, we see um, we see more um, uh, positive developments around capital allocation and expansion of the canvas 
than uh, negative developments around hitting a ceiling in their growth prospects anytime, anytime soon. Thanks, Rakshit. So uh, while we are on paint, I think worth briefly touching upon, uh, just a couple of people have asked the question about the uh, uh, impact of uh, the entry of Grassim and JSW in the paints industry. I know you've addressed it in the past webinar, so you might want to briefly touch upon that. Sure. So, um, look, first of all, this is not the first time that a competitor is entering, right? 15 years ago, in fact, 17 years ago, you can see Nitco uh, Tiles was acquired by Sherwin Williams to form Nitco Paints. And uh, the idea was that uh, Sherwin Williams is the world's largest uh, paint company. In fact, Sherwin Williams was hitting a ceiling, has been hitting a ceiling in the US, and hence they've been finding ways to uh, uh, inorganically uh, expand their footprint. Uh, uh, so they'll bring the technical know-how, they'll bring the um, uh, uh, business sense uh, of running the world's largest paint company, uh, use uh, Nitco Tiles' uh, uh, distribution and expand in India. That was the idea. They did end up spending about a billion dollar odd at that time to, to do CAPEX, to, to um, uh, uh, literally burn some money to make their uh, footprint uh, uh, through the distribution channel. Uh, they offered uh, uh, four to five times higher margin than what Asian Paints offers to the dealers. Uh, but they were not successful. In 2011, they had reached a revenue of 90 crores and they exited. Um, they sold the business to Berger in 2012, I think, and, and they exited from India uh, in the decorative paint space. JSW Paints in three years uh, hasn't, uh, hasn't achieved what they targeted to achieve. You can see this. Um, this newspaper article uh, dated three years ago, October 2019. Um, the outcome hasn't been what they what they expected to see. Uh, they haven't reached decorative paints turnover of 2,000, 2000 crores. I think they're a little more than uh, 10, 10, 15 percent on the decorative paint side if you exclude their industrial paints part. Um, so those are uh, attempts made even in the past. This is not the first time that uh, a large balance sheet player with some channel footprint has uh, has tried to expand in the paints industry. Obviously, um, uh, every company that makes 30, 35, 40% return on capital, uh, not just in paints, even otherwise, will attract competition uh, because competition will try to get a slice of the uh, high cash generation that that uh, uh, business is, uh, is delivering in that industry. Uh, but the reason why we are, uh, we are not... Uh, 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 too worried at this stage uh, is because what matters in the paint industry in order to gain market share is not the, the, the amount of uh, margin you give to the channel or uh, the, the types of uh, 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 marketing or uh, 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 capex initiatives you can take. Uh, what matters in fact uh, is uh, the ability to uh, provide inventory turns to the dealers. Um, why is inventory turns important and why is it difficult? First of all, it is important because paint is 10 times more voluminous than most other consumer durable products, right? So whether it be, let's say, FMCG, whether it be apparel, footwear, uh, the realization per unit liter of those products is at least 10 times higher than paint. And hence, Paint fetches one tenth realization per unit volume, right? And hence, in the same store, remember, for a dealer, for a shopkeeper, the biggest part of the capital employed is real estate, whether owned or leased. That's the biggest part of your capital employed. And on that uh, fixed capital employed, more or less, uh, 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 paint gets you one tenth the realization on one time of inventory sale. The second challenge is. The margin offered by Asian Paints as the market leader to these dealers is low single digits. With a low single digit margin and one tenth the realization per unit volume, effectively, in order to make the same amount of same amount of money uh, uh, in terms of return on investment, return on capital uh, in the paints dealership compared to uh, say, Kirana shop or apparel shop or a dealer, uh, a, a footwear shop, the paint dealer needs to drive inventory turns, which are 
20, 30, 40 times faster than FMCG apparel footwear inventory turns. Effectively, you need at least, say, two to three inventory turns um, in a day in order to make the same degree of ROI that you would make in a particular geography selling non-paint products. Uh, um, and that is where Asian Paints succeeds. That is where Berger is able to catch up with Asian Paints in terms of inventory turns. Um, and that is where most of the competitors, uh, they fail to, to, to match what Asian Paints provides to the channel. Now, uh, why is it difficult? Why do the competitors fail? Because uh, it doesn't require uh, uh, anything other than demand forecasting. Uh, if you want to achieve inventory turns of that degree to one and a half lakh dealers, right? Um, uh, to, to give you an analogy, think about Flipkart versus Amazon in India. One of the main reasons why Flipkart has not been as successful as Amazon has been over the last five, seven, nine years is because today, when you try to buy anything from Amazon, uh, you get deliveries at a far faster pace than Flipkart does. Now, Size of the balance sheet of the owner of Flipkart is not going to move the needle overnight for Flipkart uh, when it tries to compete with Amazon and inventory turns, right? Because it's not the size of Walmart's balance sheet that can make Flipkart deliver in three hours or four hours or um, uh, in one day what Amazon does in the same time period, right? You need demand forecasting capabilities. For that, you need to build uh, 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 data analytics. You need to build uh, 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 forecasting uh, softwares um, and that takes time. It takes time, it takes effort, can't be done in one month, two months, certainly can be done over a three year, five year period. Uh, uh, to that extent, uh, we want to see um, uh, an Asian Paints, a Berger in our portfolio, incrementally deepen their competitive advantages so that even over a three to five year period, competition doesn't catch up so easily. Um, if we see that gap uh, narrowing between competition and Asian Paints and Berger, we will take corrective action. But so far, we don't see any evidence uh, which would convince us that the gap is going to narrow in the foreseeable future. And hence, we are uh, we are not too not too worried. Um, and this is not just Asian Paints. Uh, Doctor Lal, Titan, and I, I remember even on Titan when they were the IPOs of Kalyan, PC Jewelers, TBZ, all of these companies when they had IPOed. There was a lot of noise around large balance sheets, South Indian players who know jewelry very well, expanding pan India, Titan doesn't know, uh, wedding jewelry, Titan doesn't know, uh, South Indian jewelry as well as uh, these players do, so on and so forth. So it's not just competition comes in and uh, we as investors should get worried. Uh, there's a lot beyond just large balance sheets, beyond just uh, discounted prices uh, that attracts customers to our portfolio companies when they sell their products and services. Uh, in the case of paints, it is inventory turns and demand forecasting, which is why we are not too worried in the short term. In fact, if you can, you can see the common factor across <clears throat> most of these investee companies, right? So as Rakshit explained, what Asian Paints is very cleverly doing is taking the paints business and stretching out into the broader home decor market. Uh, if you just do broad, uh, broad back of the envelope market sizing, <clears throat> India's economy is $3 trillion. Uh, half of uh, uh, $1 trillion is India's annual capex. Out of that annual capex of a trillion dollars that India does, roughly half a trillion, half a trillion dollars is home building capex in India. This is government cost tax. So Asian paints very cleverly by moving beyond paint into the home decor space is basically now targeting over the next decade of a half a trillion dollars per annum ka market. At the moment, Asian Paints ka annual revenue, Rakshit, annual revenue, four, five billion dollars, four, four and a half billion dollars. Yeah, around 30,000 crores, uh, yeah. four billion dollars. Char, 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 char billion dollars. So a company which currently does charge char, char, char billion dollar is now uh, basically aiming in broad daylight. It's aiming for a market which is 100 times its annual revenues. But because it, it does this quietly, uh, the market, the stock market focuses on the ulta point, which is grassim vasim, rather than realizing the cleverness of the Asian Paints game. Similarly, if you see Dr. Lal changing the game geographically through Suburban, offering 5,000, 5,500 tests in an industry where nobody else can offer more than 3,500 3, tests uh, beyond, beyond the basic blood test, urine test space, 
aiming for the the broader broader healthcare space through the same business model similarly titan going beyond uh, 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 start start diamond started premium jewelry into the wedding jewelry market at one end the economy market at the other end comprehensively widening the market and yet in all of these companies cases right you can throw in bajaj finance also into this context dramatic enlargement of the addressable market size bajaj finance in the last 5 years but all of these companies they enlarge the market size still generate mountains of free cash flow still generate rocs in the case of a asian pushing north of 30% a titan pushing north of 30% in the case of a bajaj finance pushing north of roes north of 20% and that's what that's what makes these companies uh, spectacular spectacularly effective in a country where the vast majority of listed on listed companies don't generate a rupee of free cash flow these companies in front of everybody are broadening their market addressable market in some cases as i did the maths for you broadening the addressable market by 100 fold yet generating massive amounts of free cash flow while the competition carries on doing narabaji and discounting and cash flow burning okay thanks sir uh just one last one on paints uh several people have asked the same question actually uh they saying um, yeah understand paints uh, asian paints is good but um, why berger paints as well and together we have almost 17% of the portfolio in paints um related to that some people are saying that we've always talked about asian but we never talk about berger so i guess you might want to combine why 17% in paint sector and um, what's uh, what's so special about berger paints right so uh, to begin with uh, uh, we we build our portfolio basis bottom up understanding of stocks whether those stocks are from the same industry or different industries it doesn't matter as long as uh, we get convinced about a certain rate of free cash flow compounding with a certain uh, degree of risk containment uh, in that fundamental compounding uh, we'll be buying that company so just like Uh, a bajaj finance competes with hdfc bank uh, an hdfc bank competes with kotak and we have all the three lenders in the portfolio uh, similarly um, uh, asian paints and berger they compete with each other but we still have both that's one way to answer but uh, 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 the second way to answer is uh, paint industry interestingly uh, has uh, uh, not been uh, a cyclical industry in india 80 85% of the paint demand in india is repainting of households uh, the repainting of households is uh, is a repetitive process um, and repainting cycles are shrinking as affordability is rising and hence the paint industry's volume growth has been a very healthy 10 11 12% uh, which is a very high rate of volume growth for any industry to have right uh, now interestingly within that industry um asian paints has set the bar very high on um on 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 inventory turns based competitive advantages what berger has done which attracts us towards berger is on the one hand they managed to uh, avoid letting the gap between asian paints and berger's is inventory turns open up uh, berger's inventory turns to dealers are not the same as asian paints they are a shade lower but the gap doesn't open wider and hence as a second choice uh, uh, which most dealers would want to have no dealer wants to be just an exclusive asian paints dealer all the time as a second choice berger is head and shoulders above uh, a narrow lack a dulux and the gap between asian and berger uh, between the roi that the uh, paint, paint dealer would make uh, doesn't widen uh, then interestingly what berger does is uh, especially over the last 12 11 12 years um, once in every 6 months we've noticed berger has tried to exploit uh, an inefficiency in the paint industry that asian paints hasn't yet exploited it might be a little marginal but that marginal piece it always adds an extra 100 to 200 basis points of growth to berger's earnings either by uh, uh, providing some uh, uh, margin expansion of that degree or uh, even on the volume side uh, berger's volume growth 
has not lagged behind Asian. In fact, Berger's revenue and volume are very similar in the rate of growth uh, with Asian in the past, pre predominantly because of this uh, uh, this sort of an approach where uh, you can see you can see the four-year sales CAGR of Berger is also twenty percent, which is the same as the four-year sales CAG CAGR of Asian Paints. Um, just to give you an example uh, uh, from something that I found very interesting uh, early on when we used to cover Berger and uh, we started owning it six, seven years ago, uh, we noticed that Berger started reaching out to painters directly uh, when Asian Paints used to reach out to painters via the dealers. Now, why do you need to reach out to the painters really? The painters uh, are offered uh, uh, incentives uh, uh, whether it be a 5 kg bag of rice or whether it be a small pressure cooker or uh, uh, even a cash incentive, a Paytm incentive or something like that. Uh, painters are incentivized in the paint industry. They have been incentivized for several years. Just that Asian Paints had set the standard of incentivizing uh, as going through the paint dealers. The paint dealers would be reporting which painter has painted how many liters of which product. And accordingly, the paint dealers will be provided the five kg bag of uh, rice, let's say, which the paint dealer will forward to the painter. Uh, in many cases, uh, the paint dealer would support the captive painter, even though the captive painter hasn't done all the painting work. In many cases, the bag of five kg rice would be retained by the paint dealer and not passed on to the end painter. Uh, and Berger tried to exploit uh, that piece. Uh, they, they started putting a, a token, a coin at the bottom of the paint bucket. They set up a call center and they told all the painters to log their token number with the call center directly. And only the painter who has used the paint, uh, finished the paint bucket, can get access to the token. The paint dealer was, in a way, disintermediated in the process of incentivizing the painter. Now, that, that was one example. There are several such examples that we keep coming across as we travel across the length and breadth of this country and meet paint dealers and painters to understand why, what product, which company is being able to sell uh, in what manner. Uh, in a similar way, after GST, Berger took a few extra initiatives than what Asian Paints did. Now, in all of these cases, uh, Asian Paints... Uh, 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 catches up with the uh, uh, arbitrage that Berger had tried to capture. And the arbitrage gets closed because after six or 12 months, Asian Paints copies what Berger had uh, exploited that Asian Paints had left unaddressed in the paint industry. But that uh, recurring, uh, recurring uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, exploitation of unaddressed areas of uh, uh, the paint industry that Berger does is where um, is where uh, Asian Paints uh, is where Berger uh, also ends up compounding at the same rate as Asian Paints, despite not having demand forecasting capabilities of the same level as that of Asian Paints. By the way, uh, their demand forecasting capabilities today are very similar to what Asian Paints had a few years ago. But yeah, both companies they 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 keep looking at each other eye to eye and uh, and and don't let the gap open up. Uh, significantly, particularly Berger doesn't, um, which is the reason why it remains in our portfolio, but a smaller allocation because there are several other factors around longevity where we are more convinced about the longevity of Asian Paints than we are of Berger. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, so that's the reason. Thanks, Akshit. Uh, I think that's a lot of paint for today. We should uh, tackle some of the other questions. Uh, there's one question I think has come in different flavors. I think it's a very important question and we should address it. In terms of expected returns, expected alpha, or what time horizons? I'll give you the different questions verbatim so that you get the flavor. <clears throat> okay, so one, one investor has asked, Marcellus portfolios are compounding below the index. I understand, should investors judge Marcellus by alpha over index over three or five years, or is that not a right measure? So just park that. Uh, said, are you guys happy with CCP's performance so far? What are the misses? What could be done better? And there's another gentleman who's saying that you guys point to 10x in 10 years, which 
implies 26%, but you keep talking about 20% CAGR. So how should we be thinking about 10X? And then a straightforward question of what is the targeted returns for CCP Marcellus uh, over a seven to 10 years time frame? And then finally, one again, sort of related to alpha is how much is CCP correlated to Nifty 50? Do you think if Nifty doesn't move much, CCP will still keep going up? So I think if you sum it all up, best to guide our uh, investors on what do we think um, is 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 uh, is uh, is a realistic expectation of returns and over what time periods do we uh, target those and do we even target alpha or alpha is more of a byproduct sorry i was on mute um, okay so let me use this chart first <clears throat> and uh, because this quantifies the message in a very nice way. I mean, you can use this chart or you can refer to Coffee Can Investing Exhibit 63, um, or you can use uh, um, uh, this chart as well, which is a, uh, a different way of articulating the same message. So look at the one-year bubble, right? The one-year bubble has a standard deviation of around 30%, 30, 35, something like that. Uh, and the one-year bubble has an average return of around say 25%, right? Now, uh, this is basis back test. Uh, this doesn't include expenses, charges, uh, stuff like that, which when you invest in a PMS, uh, you, will be, uh, you will be incurring. Uh, now, on, on this one year bubble, the 30, 35% standard deviation and 25% average return means that for a one year holding period, the worst case scenario of one standard deviation outcomes, if you assume normal distribution, one standard deviation outcomes means 66% of all outcomes, right? Will be, the worst case scenario will be 25% average minus 30% mean, uh, standard deviation. 25% average minus 30% standard deviation, which means you can actually get minus 5% return with a 65% probability over a one year time horizon, right? If you do two standard deviations, it's actually 25 minus 60, 30% multiplied by two. Uh, two standard deviations, which means 95% probability band will have its worst case scenario on a one year period as being uh, uh, a significant negative. Now, it will be a very rare occurrence, but it is, uh, an occurrence. When you look at our Marcellus CCP, I think the worst one year performance has been a low single digit negative, right? Minus two, minus four, something like that. Even during the COVID, at the bottom of the COVID, uh, I think the 12 month period ending 23rd March 2020, the one year performance was zero or one percent, something like that, right? So uh, uh, that is the worst case uh, quantification, worst case scenario quantification using the standard deviation and portfolio performance. So don't just look at the average on a one year basis. You can have, you will have volatility even in CCP. If you really see standard deviation of Nifty versus standard deviation of CCP is not too different. The difference is that more often than not, CCP's volatility is on the upside. Roughly 70-80% of the cases, CCP's volatility of a one-year standard deviation is on the upside, uh, as in better than average, rather than nifty, where only in 50-60% of the cases, the volatility is on the upside. The remaining 40-45% of the cases for nifty, the volatility is on the downside. Right. Uh, so more often than not, you will see a one-year time horizon delivering a healthy absolute and a healthy relative return. But there could be some instances where the absolute or relative is uh, uh, weak. And those instances, as long as we keep buying high quality portfolio companies, those instances of weak absolute, weak relative return will be led by noise. There'll be a lot of noise over a six month, three month, one month, one year time horizon. If you judge 
either ccp or nifty or any other uh, 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 equity investment if you judge it by its six months performance by its one year performance uh, you are actually uh, pointing in the wrong direction if you ask the fund manager to comment on a one year return right uh, uh, you are asking the fund manager the wrong question you are looking at the wrong data point the moment you look at 3 year 5 year 7 year as i showed you here in these charts the moment you increase your time horizon to 3 year the luck factor the noise in the portfolio will reduce incredibly that's where the return will be closer to the mean that is what you need to judge a fund manager on is the mean a 20 is the mean a 25 15 10 5 0 or something else right you will get to know of the mean only if you increase the time horizon to more than 3 years if you uh, look at a time horizon of less than 3 years you can look at a deceptive number you can look at a number which is not representative of long term rate of compounding via that portfolio right you can look at the outcome of more luck than fundamentals if you're looking at a 6 month or a 12 month time horizon in that context it's quite interesting to look at this chart which effectively is what the first of the series of questions that uh, pramod articulated is is talking about should you measure marcellus basis well if you measure marcellus basis one month you should be very excited the moment you look at 6 months which includes that one month you will be very disappointed the moment you look at uh, uh, uh one year uh, 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 you will be disappointed in a different way right think about it one year you are disappointed more on the relative six month you are disappointed on an absolute more one month you are happy about both right and that one month is actually included in the six month and the one year that is all noise nothing other than noise none of these bars are indicative of the underlying capability of the fund of the fund manager right uh, this is where you don't have to look um, unfortunately you will have to have patience uh, in order to uh, okay, why don't we simplify life for these guys so if they take the from inception number of 19.83 right assume yeah. around that 220 and if we were to go to the sevi website and pull out the data from jan 17 we pull out the data from jan 17 for for our erstwhile avatar right jan 17 to now would be all, uh, by by jan 23 it'll be almost 6 years so jan 17 mein shuru hua tha jan 23 will be almost 6 years what would that number roughly come to if we, uh, if we assume that the next 3 4 months nothing sort of dramatically changes no even till date uh, the cagr which is roughly 5 and a half years of cagr it is around uh, 23% uh, yes and, and if you assume that out of that say fees and expenses have sucked out 2% then no, that's net of uh, sort of that's no, net of that's not 23 net right that's a net number so the gross yeah. the gross number ends up being the 5.5 saal ka 5 and a half years ka uh, uh, gross number ends up being the being in the mid 20s region and the reason for that is no great surprise the reason for that is the underlying company's profits sorry the underlying company's cash flows a compounding broadly at that rate right and as rakshit showed you when he showed you the the three year numbers for lots of these stocks uh, uh pat compounding over the three years the last three years that is pat compounding over the last three years for many of these companies is is in the mid teens higher teens and as rakshit has shown you repeatedly free cash flow compounding free cash flow compound for these stocks over the last three years has been the mid 20s which underpins in turn uh, a gross gross portfolio compounding in the mid 20s knock off from that two percentage points for fees and expenses and you end up with a sade 5 saal ka kagar of of uh, of 23 the the 19.83 is the marcellus track record if you want to add on the like for like numbers for one and a half years prior you end up with a five and a half year track record of 23 but again once we say 23 you guys will go running saying 23 23 then you will buy then you'll call up sales as soon as the one year number is below 23 you'll call up sales to say are any number nahi aaya and again we will go through the same uh, whole routine again saying short term numbers are noise long term numbers are signal long term numbers are indeed signal and the signal is driven by this uh, chart that rakshit is showing you
Yeah. So now answering that piece of 10x in 10 years, I mean, obviously, uh, um, that's uh, that's a simplification of mid 20s CAGR. Uh, uh, whether it be honestly speaking, whether it be 20 percent or 22 or 25, I don't think uh, uh, those numbers are different from each other in a in a very meaningful manner. Um, uh, uh, so when you look at uh, uh, underlying fundamentals compounding over any time horizon, and here you can see uh, a few periods higher than 25, few periods lower than 25. Um, when you look at uh, net net longer than uh, three year, five year uh, CAGR of fundamentals being more than 20%, right? Subtract from it fees and expenses add to it few benefits such as rebalancing activity, et cetera, which we derive. And uh, they have actually more than offset the fees and expenses in many cases, uh, if you quantify uh, the benefit of some of the fund management activity rather than the underlying fundamental compounding. Um, net, net, that's where, that's where that messaging is, that at least 18 to 20%, uh, the higher the better, but uh, promise low, uh, deliver high. Uh, 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 should be the way to look at uh, CCP's expected returns. Great, thanks, thanks, Richard. So uh, there's a question from a client who says, "I'm an investor with you guys. I have a lump sum amount of money. Um, what should I do in terms of timing my investments?" Although I hear you guys uh, say that timing isn't particularly uh, great to pursue, but given everything that's happening in the world, between the two options, putting in say 20% a month or putting in lump sum uh, in one shot, what would you recommend? Um, so we've always recommended uh, as long as your investment horizon is long enough and you have faith in the underlying stocks, uh, a lump sum always not always at least has a better chance of delivering a delivering a, a better outcome over a reasonably long period of time having said that we also have provided the stp facility for those who are not particularly good with dealing with volatility uh, right it's not everybody's cup of tea i don't think um, you know we as human beings in general are cut out to handle volatility uh, and it's absolutely fine to uh, choose the stp which is basically uh, doing a staggered investment and the choice of either of these two options has got nothing to do with what's happening in the world today it's just more to do with uh, what type of uh, people we are and our understanding of what type of people we are and mind you in either case the difference particularly if your investment horizon is long enough the difference in either of these options is not going to be materially different from each other. So, mm -hmm. so by all means, uh, choose either option and and you know be at peace with it. But uh, I don't think neither us nor anybody else will be able to tell you any better on uh, what you should do given how the world is looking today, because none of us really know how the world is going to transpire over the next few months. In fact, uh, uh, sorry, Pramod, so let me quantify in another way. Uh, uh, how immaterial it is uh, when it comes to timing. So, so let's say you invest today versus somebody who invested one month ago in CCP. Now, the person who invested one month ago has already got this 14.42% uh, in their portfolio. If you invest today, uh, you are worse off than that investor by 14.42%. Uh, the first one-year performance differential between uh, you and the one-month a go investor, one month old investor, the one year performance differential will be 14.42, no doubt about it. But the three year, five year, seven year differential will be low single digits in CAGR terms, right? Uh, the five year uh, differential will be no more than two and a half percent. The 10 year differential will be no more than 100 basis points, right? Uh, so that's the uh, degree to which it becomes immaterial in the long run. Uh, 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 right now, uh, could we have, could you have, or could the one month old investor have predicted this 14.42% precisely for which month it will be? Nobody could have, right? So regardless of whether you choose STP or uh, single shot, it won't make more than 100 basis points difference over a very long term. And if you are not invested in the long term horizon concept, then it's actually uh, not going to help you regardless of whether you invest in high quality or low quality. Uh, because you won't compound your wealth over a one-year period anywhere. 
Okay, so Rakshit, so few more people are complaining that we mostly talk about Asian pains and Dr. Lal, and they want us to talk about a few other stocks in the portfolio. Uh, particularly mentions I've seen as DVs, given that uh, reported numbers seem to be good, yet the stock is stock, stock is collapsing. And uh, ICICI, Lombard, and Titan are the other two stocks. Uh, if you want to spend a few minutes on each each of these, sure. Yeah. Now, um, coming to DVs, to begin with, the reason why we are uh, we are highly convinced about uh, DVs as a as a company is its uh, execution of uh, uh, both the generics API business as well as the custom synthesis, which are roughly half half each uh, in terms of revenue contribution uh, uh, to DVs overall. Uh, when it comes to API, it's the it's the process efficiency that uh, DVs offers to the larger pharma companies who are its B2B customers, uh, the, the, uh, the, the API efficiencies and hence the, the, the scale at which DVs can offer production manufacturing of those APIs and the price that DVs can offer to, to its customers, it's unmatched. Uh, that's the reason why in APIs as basic as, in APIs as basic as, uh, those used for uh, uh, naproxen, um, uh, so cough syrups and painkillers, uh, DVs, um, uh, DVs is global market share. And I'm talking about global here, not India or not a small industry. For cough syrups and painkillers, uh, DVs is global market share is north of 40, 50% uh, in these products. Uh, it has maintained or increased its market share over any historic time period uh, only because uh, they backward integrate they improve their uh, process efficiencies of manufacturing. That ends up offering a uh, scale with lower pricing uh, to their customers that is unmatched by anybody else. That is, the, uh, is one part of the business. The other part of the business is custom synthesis where products which are not yet off patent, uh, 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 the, 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 the patent owner uh, outsources uh, the manufacturing to DVs. Now, this is where uh, there are uh, uh, there are massive competitive advantages around trust uh, that DVs has, uh, which is the hardest part to build. Remember, trust is uh, 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 something really hard when it comes to pharma companies in India dealing with uh, large conglomerates outside of India as their customers or uh, or partners. Um, what DVs offers its customers who are the large pharma patent owners on many of the uh, patented drugs. What DVs offers is a trust that DVs won't uh, 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 jeopardize the, the secrecy of the formula. DVs won't compromise on the quality of manufacturing and uh, DVs will stick to all the uh, requirements, the standards of, uh, of manufacturing that the, that the uh, patent owner requires DVs to have. This degree of trust built with the larger players like, say, a Pfizer, a Mylan, etc., this degree of trust has been built over 30 long years now, right? In 1992, when this company was founded, since then, uh, the, the founder, the Murli DV, and, uh, and his team has built this trust with the larger pharma players uh, very gradually in a very meaningful manner. It cannot be disrupted overnight by a new competitor trying to offer a 5% lower cost of production to any of these companies. Um, more importantly, this piece provides a massive pipeline for the API business, both on the capability side as well as on the revenue acquisition, customer acquisition side, as these uh, pharma uh, as these patented drugs, they go off patent uh, at some point in future. So that's really the, the degree, degree to which there's stickiness and consistency of, uh, of growth in, uh, in DVs. Um, and uh, in the last five years, particularly, uh, this company has accelerated CAPEX. Now, obviously, uh, they won't come in front of uh, investors and media and uh, give all the details of uh, private uh, uh, details of uh, uh, confidential uh, information around uh, patents, uh, which they are in the process of uh, tying up with, uh, 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 because obviously that confidentiality is the reason why their competitive competitive advantage has always existed. So uh, the investor community uh, 
uh, from one quarter to another does get um, uh, uh, sort of disappointed at times, uh, and hence the share price does exhibit uh, volatility or excitement uh, or concerns, uh, uh, depending on how the quarterly results went about. Uh, but uh, when you look at the fundamentals over any sort of two year, three year, five year time horizon of DVs, um, you see the, uh, the, the, the sort of strength of the business uh, in, the, in the consistency and the rate at which the fundamentals compound um, as, uh, as they derive more and more efficiencies out of their manufacturing processes. So that's, uh, that's on DVs. Uh, the other business you asked for about was about Titan. Um, so Titan is a business which was very differently uh, positioned till four or five years ago than it is today. Five years ago, it was a, a jewelry play only. Uh, within jewelry, it was offering uh, products, uh, transaction values with the customers being in the range of 50,000 rupees to 2 lakh. Typically, very rarely would a household buy wedding jewelry uh, of 10 lakh ticket size, 20 lakh or something like that from Tanishk. Um, it was offering making charges on gold, averaging around 18 to 20%. Um, uh, and um, it was uh, running every non-jewelry business either at a subscale level or in a non-profitable level, whether it be eyewear, watches, um, uh, 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 sort of uh, perfumes, um, they launched the Naira, Sadi, so on and so forth. Uh, right, uh, that was Tanishk led Titan uh, five or six years ago. Uh, uh, one of the main reasons uh, why we never owned it till uh, uh, three years ago in our portfolio. But this business has radically transformed, particularly under the new management. And there was a massive uh, succession event that happened when uh, I think eight, eight CXOs, they uh, retired uh, in the space of uh, 14 or 15 months, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Bhaskar Bhatt, uh, 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 including uh, CFO, chief of HR, uh, so on and so forth. Now, the, under the new management, today's Titan, to begin with, within jewelry, is much beyond just the 50,000 to 2 lakh ticket size uh, uh, transaction uh, to the customer. Uh, wedding jewelry is roughly one quarter of Titan's business. They have nailed it uh, partly by uh, uh, leveraging on the scale that they had, which means that let's say in a Cochin, uh, there isn't just one Tanish store. Uh, in, a, in a small town in say Karnataka, there isn't just one Tanish store. Uh, there are multiple stores even in a small micro market. That's the benefit of scale, which helps you in wedding jewelry. Why? Because wedding jewelry merchandise is very local. Uh, what sells in Karnataka won't sell in Maharashtra necessarily. What sells in Maharashtra certainly won't sell in Delhi or Calcutta. The unsold inventory uh, should not be bloating up on the balance sheet of the jeweler. If you do wedding jewelry in the way that, uh, that Titan has approached it using their scale, unsold uh, wedding jewelry of store X in Cochin can be used for uh, uh, driving sales in store Y. Unsold from store Y in Cochin can be used for driving sales in store Z in Cochin. If within, say, a small micro market of 50 kilometer radius or 100 kilometer radius, you have multiple Tanish stores, then uh, offering localized merchandise becomes far more viable. Uh, that is one reason. The second reason is the team itself at Titan, we understood, uh, spent a lot of time to, to understand the local preferences in a better way than they previously understood. right? Uh, and hence today, one quarter of Titan's jewelry sales are, uh, are from non- uh, are from wedding jewelry. right? Wedding jewelry, 70% of jewelry industry in India. Uh, if Titan hadn't targeted wedding, uh, the question of ceiling, which uh, I think uh, another participant asked on Asian paints, the question of ceiling would have uh, uh, applied on Tanishk as well, because Tanishk could have hit a ceiling on growth if it wasn't catering to 70% of the jewelry industry, which is wedding jewelry. right? Uh, so, so this new revenue growth driver added to Titan through wedding is a massive addition. The second piece is Carrot Lane where it has both elements of digital as well as 
smaller ticket sizes than Tanishq's ticket size, right? It in effect becomes the funnel for future Tanishq sales. Uh, today's customers of Carrot Lane are highly likely uh, going to be tomorrow's customers of Tanishq. More importantly, uh, uh, as the customer behavior uh, becomes more digital, more digital, more omni-channel, right? Uh, Carrot Lane is the leader in driving the customer behavior evolution. Uh, rather than being worried about disruption because of this evolution, Titan is going to disrupt via Carrot Lane uh, through the evolving customer behavior, uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, new age company in jewelry, if you were to call it, uh, 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 using Carrot Lane. So that's on the jewelry itself, uh, expanded canvas on both sides, higher ticket size as well as lower ticket size, and that too in a disruptive manner. Um, and then uh, this is also a management team which has uh, not shied from or not been sort of uh, uh, too conservative around uh, uh, investing time, effort, money, learning uh, beyond jewelry, right? They always had eyewear, but they didn't have the, the frames manufacturing in-house till three years ago. Uh, they radically changed that. They always had eyewear but they wouldn't shut down uh, unprofitable stores so easily as they've done in the last two or three years. And hence, uh, EBITDA margins in eyewear, which today are 18, 20%, uh, were actually loss-making uh, till exactly three years ago. Uh, right? That's the degree to which eyewear as a business has been turned around. Eyewear as an industry is as unorganized as jewelry as an industry is. Eyewear is an, as an industry is very, very large in size. It's not a small 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 crore revenue industry. This is a mega industry, highly unorganized. Titan, despite being the largest organized player, is uh, minuscule in market share and hence a massive runway for further consolidating this space, uh, uh, provided it had made money, which it is now making money in uh, by the bucket loads. Um, and then, comes uh, future potential uh, uh, growth drivers around uh, turning around watches with the, the, the digital, the, the wearables, the, uh, uh, the, the, the non-traditional types of wearables. Uh, uh, it's not a success yet. Uh, we at Marcellus, our analysts haven't baked it yet into their expectations, but there is a possibility that they might turn around watches in a profitable manner. Uh, uh, in a scalable manner, uh, they might uh, scale up the, the Naira in sadis uh, as the as the largest consolidator of uh, sadi retail, uh, so on and so forth. But it's largely eyewear and jewelry, uh, which are scaling up in a very nice, meaningful way with high, strong competitive advantages, uh, which is the reason why we are invested in Titan. Uh, Rakshit, so in the interest of time, maybe ICC and Lombard will deal with uh, in the next webinar, maybe in the Kings of Capital webinar. Um, given Saurabh and I need to hop on to another call in a minute, uh, I'll leave you with uh, you know one again uh, uh, question that we've often been asked. This is coming from Hemant Amin, who says that uh, most of your companies have very high PE ratios, growth rates over the last five years are probably in the teens. Fees are in the 60 to 80 range. How will investors make above average returns given these odds? I know you've, we've dealt with this question uh, many a times in the past, and I think it's worth uh, worth repeating that take. I mean, well, Saurabh and I will we'll drop off the call. Sure. Thanks, Pramod. Thanks, Saurabh. Um, so um, uh, there are two or three different ways to understand the answer to this question. The first one is, this slide, which we had projected previously, uh, just look at the gap between earnings growth and free cash flow growth for every 5, 10, or 15 year time horizon in the past for these companies, right? The gap has been very consistently a 6 to 7%, 22 versus 15, 25 versus 19, 31 versus 25. These are like to like time periods. Earnings growth lags behind free cash flow for these portfolio companies by an average of 5, 6, 7% on a CAGR basis. What that means is, Valuations, which are always free cash flow led, um, uh, uh, they, 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 they will uh, have, a, have a faster rate of growth driver, which is free cash flow, than earnings. When you look at price to free cash flows, the, uh, the share prices have compounded exactly at the rate at which 
free cash flows have compounded for these companies plus minus one or two percent and hence the price to free cash flow multiple of these companies over the last 5 10 15 years hasn't expanded or compressed but when it comes to price to earnings um, price to earnings have increased over the last 15 years at a rate of 6% annually right and that's where uh, uh, i think uh, one needs to appreciate uh, that working capital compression and asset turn expansion which are not captured in earnings growth but do contribute to free cash flow compounding are two massive tools that these companies have adopted in the new age tech oriented era because tech investments help you compress working capital cycles in a structural manner if you are investing in tech in a structural manner um, uh, none of the companies are at zero uh, networking capital cycle level and hence the ceiling on working capital efficiencies isn't yet hit uh, isn't uh, likely to be hit in the next five or ten years either uh, these efficiencies will continue for another uh, decade or longer at least the gap between earnings growth and free cash flow growth will sustain if it doesn't sustain uh, earnings and free cash flows will compound at the same rate. PE multiples will not expand because share prices will com uh, compound at a rate of free cash flows, which will also be the rate of earnings growth. In the past, free cash flows have compounded at a rate faster than earnings, and hence price to earnings multiples have expanded. That's one point uh, very important to take home. Uh, the second point is, uh, on an absolute basis, barring this sort of a PE multiple expansion of 5-6% annually, uh, barring this piece, the PE multiples even in 10, 10 years ago, even five years ago were expensive relative to uh, their competitors relative to the rest of the stock market. Um, uh, when uh, when PE multiples uh, for Asian paints were 35 uh, 10 years ago, uh, 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 investors used to consider that expensive. Today, when they are at 65, investors use, investor consider that as expensive, uh, right? PE multiples were always expensive. You, you never had, you never will have uh, high quality compounders uh, trade at PE multiples of 5, 10, 15 times. If they can give uh, bulk of the investor community confidence in the longevity and the rate at which they, they are likely to compound their free cash flows in future. Now, uh, provided the greatness of a company's business model sustains and every year you see the longevity uh, get rolled forward, right? So let's say if if you had X number of years of longevity visibility uh, sitting in 2020, and the same X number of years of longevity visibility is what you see sitting in 2030, <coughs> then between 2020 and 2030, the share price compounding will mirror free cash flow compounding, right? Uh, uh, because the P multiple will not converge to deliver uh, to, to 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 deliver a uh, a, a, a sort of a terminal growth rate of five or seven as we use in the DCF, et cetera, uh, after the end of that 10-year period, right? So, so provided the greatness rolls on, the greatness sustains through incremental capital allocation decisions that these companies take, the share prices will compound at the rate of free cash flows. And if that happens, a little bit of PE multiple or price to free cash flow multiple expansion or compression is not going to meaningfully affect the rate at which uh, share prices compound over a three, five, seven, ten year time horizon, right? Um, so combine the two points together. Why PEs have expanded by at least five percent annually over the last fifteen years, with the fact that price to free cash flow uh, hasn't uh, compressed um, uh, even as time has progressed because the greatness has rolled forward. Um, effectively gives you the answer. Now going forward, if these companies they stop. Uh, uh, incrementally reinvesting their capital to sustain greatness. If their competitive advantages get diluted, if they start hitting the ceiling and hence the longevity gets compromised, uh, any of these factors, if they play out, then yes, you are right. Um, uh, P multiple of 50, 60, 70 times, price to free cash flow multiples where they currently stand, they are not justified and they will not sustain. Uh, that's when uh, we will certainly uh, exit from that company uh, in our portfolio. Uh, uh, before that, we would have certainly reduced the weight of that company in a massive way, uh, and that would have eventually caused an exit as well. Uh, but just a 5-10% increase or decrease in the share price of a heavily undervalued company uh, doesn't call for uh, any exits uh, from our portfolio, which is why, uh, despite the compounding in the share prices of these companies, we've not uh, exited from them uh, in our portfolio, and the portfolio has a low churn. So, uh, so I'll stop there.
thanks everyone for attending um, and uh, next month we'll bring a new subject new context and uh, and see you again there thank you